or clothes you can wear or something. How many pairs of shoes can you buy, you know? Uh, but he has more than enough for a hundred lifetimes. So what is he doing? He's giving his money away. You see? So this is what a person does when they're in love. They have surplus. They're giving away. They're not taking. Huh? They're giving especially to the object of their love, but they're also their happiness is overspilling and flowing out to everyone around them. Everybody likes to be around someone who's in love because their mood is like broadcasting out. It's coming out uh, just without any effort, effortlessly. Uh, they don't even have to try. But everybody wants to be around somebody like this because it's just so pleasant. Uh, everybody wanted to be around Srila Prabhupada, for example. It was wonderful just to be with Srila Prabhupada because he's a totally in love with Krishna. And this love came out and you could feel it even when he was trying to hide it. See, advanced devotee always hides his love, his ecstasy, because it's just too much. It wouldn't be appropriate to display at all times, you know, in front of people. But still it comes out. Huh? It's just like you can't hide. You can put a lamp under a basket, but you still you can't hide it. The, la the light will come out somehow. <laughs> so it's like that. A devotee who is really in love, who is really doing sacrifice for Krishna, huh? They, they're not thinking, oh, will Krishna take care of me or will he not take care of me? Um, it, he doesn't care. It's just not, it's not even on the radar scope. Not even a consideration. Krishna says, oh, I mean, sorry, Lord Chaitanya says, my dear Krishna, you can, you can dance with me or you can trample me under your feet. Uh, you can keep me or you can kill me, as you like. I don't care. But you're always my worshipable Lord. I'm always in love with you. He's thinking like that. Krishna can reciprocate or not. doesn't matter. So if there's any thought of what I am getting from Krishna, then it's not devotional service. It's a deal. It's karma. Karma yoga. Uh, karma yoga... It, it, it's a little bit of that kind of deal-making consciousness there, you know. But it's a beginning. But the, the real thing, the real pure devotional service is, I don't care whether Krishna reciprocates or not. I don't care about this body. I don't care about this material world. I don't care about any of this stuff. I'm an eternal spirit soul. Huh? I exist forever, no matter what happens. I'm indestructible. Huh? So let me just love Krishna. There's nothing better than this, nothing higher than this. I'm in love. Yeah. Huh? How did we get on this subject? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a good subject. <laughs> <laughs> and another question? Hmm. Question from... Hmm. Question from Mike. I can understand that when engaged in karma yoga directly, serving personally under a spiritual master, that it must be a lot easier to keep the mind in Krishna, especially in a pure atmosphere. How do we do so when in work in the material world? Although the fruits will be surrendered, and so I am not working for personal gain, it is very tough to keep the mind on Krishna at all times. Well, the, the mind is kept on Krishna by the fact that the ultimate goal of the work is to contribute the money to Krishna's cause. See, your plan is, I'm going to work at this job, and then I'm going to use the money to go visit the, the community and hang out with the devotees, isn't it? So the, the, the Krishna consciousness comes in by the fact that your intention from the beginning is to engage the fruits of your labor in devotional service. 
That's karma yoga. Yes, when you're in the midst of it all, um, you can't always keep your mind on Krishna. When I was in my technical writing business, I had to think. I had to use my intelligence. I had to use my mind to think about business stuff, you know. That was my job. <laughs> it's like, your job is to think about computers. Oh, okay. So I can't think about Krishna because my mind is not very intelligent. So I can only think about one thing at a time. So I had to think about this nonsense to do my job. But then at the end of the day, I get home to my nice apartment and I have my altar and I offer arti to Krishna and then I read from Bhagavad Gita and then I chant my rounds and then I cook some nice prasadam and offer that. So you see, because of the results of my work being offered to Krishna, then the work itself is also considered karma yoga. Even though maybe while doing the work, you can't keep your mind on Krishna. That's par for the course. It's a gradual process. Yeah, it's a gradual process. And you come to the point where you, when you offer the results, ah, then it's very nice. Then there's it's confusing. Yeah, because it's uh, the questions are not very well written, but hmm. we'll just read whatever's there. Are you sure? No, no. It's, in... it's one of these questions that starts out. Well, I was born on a cold yeah. and stormy night in the backwoods of Tennessee, you know, on my mother's lap, but no. Yes, something like that. <laughs> but basically is there's three. Is it right to practice Qigong and Tai Chi to keep from getting sick? Yeah, you do whatever it takes to keep your body healthy for service. Uh I I teach Tai Chi, so I'm starting to, but I don't not I do not wish to teach it to teach it as an impersonal art. So well, then hang a picture of Krishna on the wall. It seemed to me I could <laughs> teach the students to hear the name of Krishna in the breath. Well, breath. it's really kind of off the topic, you know. If people come there expecting Tai Chi and Qigong, and, and you start talking about Krishna. You know, it's going to be like, again, that's not what they came there to hear. No? So what's going to happen, they're going to make an offense. They're, they're going to get critical. So if you're teaching Tai Chi and Qigong, and you just hang a picture of Krishna on the wall, you know, that's practical. They'll see the picture of Krishna... Probably they'll put two and two together and figure out that you're a devotee. And then if they really want to know, they'll ask you. Or you can offer at the end of the class, if anybody wants to know more about spiritual philosophy, we have this other class. See? That's how uh, devotees teach yoga, for example. Hatha yoga. They'll have a regular Hatha Yoga class, huh? just like all the other Hatha Yoga places. And they have a picture of Krishna on the wall, and at the end they say, look, actually this yoga is coming from the Vedas, and the Vedas talk about Krishna as being the supreme being and like that. And if you want to know more, we have this other class that you can go to that talks all about that. Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Do you invite them to another event where you talk specifically about devotional service? But you see, we don't want to create this idea that we're cheating. If we give a class on Qigong, and then in the middle of Qigong class we start talking about Krishna, people are going to say, oh, it's those Hari Krishnas again. You know, they tried to sell me a book at the airport, and they wound off ripping me off for a 10-pound note. 
And, you know, that sucks. And yeah, it does suck. Don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be impeccable. So that when people think of you as a devotee, they think, yeah, he's one of those Hare Krishnas, but you know what? He's a great guy. That's the impression you want to give. So yeah, invite people for Qigong or Chai Chi or whatever you know. I like Xing Yi myself. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the class, you just say, oh, we have this other class, and invite them to watch a video of Sunday Satsang or something like that. Huh? That's it. That's it. Oh, now we chant. <laughs>